Good evening. Welcome to the second of our briefings tonight at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. We have uh, tonight with us Dr. Heidi Hamill, who will be discussing in just a moment uh, the first image from the Hubble Space Telescope that we received just a short while ago this evening. Dr. Hamill? Thank you, Brian. I just want to get it right over with and show you this image. We can have the image. What you're seeing is a full disk of Jupiter taken with the, with the wide field camera in a blue filter. The wavelength is 410 nanometers. And you see on the left a blow up of the impact site. It's expanded and enhanced so you can see it. It's very dark. We have wavelengths ranging from 3,036 nanometers out to 9,956 uh, nanometers. We don't have those all ready to show you now because we obviously haven't had enough time to do that. But I'd like to describe for you what it looks like. Um, at all wavelengths except a methane band, it looks like this. It's dark and it has this dark material to the south. In the methane band image, the wavelength is 889 nanometers. Everything that you see is dark there is bright. It's completely inverted. Looks like a negative image. We don't fully understand what we're seeing here yet. We don't have ready for you yet images that were taken in the previous orbit. In that orbit, what we could see at all wavelengths was what looked like a plume on the limb of the planet. And then we saw the plume flatten as if it was spreading out. And that was all we saw. We detected it at all those wavelengths, though. And so we'll be working throughout the night to get these data ready to show to you tomorrow morning. I would now like to show you a video, if any of you are not convinced that this is from this comet, <laughs> I, I would like to show you a video of what Jupiter looked like yesterday. And this is brand new preliminary data and it's in a fairly raw format so you'll see seams and colors that if we had had more than 18 hours we would have m done a prettier job. But I wanted you to see the quality of imaging that we're getting from the Hubble Space Telescope. So if we could run that video please. It was created by Eric de Young based on six orbits of data yesterday afternoon. And I hope we have the video. Can and you roll the video, please? Okay, it, it's going out on the satellite. We'll have it uh, here shortly. Okay. This will basically take um, five different images of Hubble um, and what we have done is map project them and then recombine them to make basically a sphere. I hope we do get to see it. Well, while they're working on that, let me just show you the geometry of this impact in case some of you are a little bit confused because that's a very confusing image. If this is Jupiter and you're all on the Earth, you're looking this way, okay? Jupiter's spinning like this, okay? These impacts, this train of comets, nuclei, are coming in from the bottom at about an angle something like this. And you can't see them happen. All right? Uh, there we go. Let's take a quick look at the video. This is a very rough reconstruction, but you can see the amazing quality of the images from the wide field camera. And there is the site. It's going to stop on a, uh, the right longitude so you can see the uh, pre-impact view. There's the great red spot and a white oval. This is the wide field camera. With the planetary camera, we're going to get even better resolution. And we'll, of course, we'll have a little bit of time to clean this up and it'll be a really nice video when we get that chance. Okay, that's the view, very similar, not quite exactly the same, but similar to the impact site. You see the great red spot and you see that little white plume off to the side, uh, just below and to the left. And if we could go back to the other one, I don't know if that's possible or not. <laughs> yes, we can. We'll look again for the great red spot and that white spot and you'll see where the little black thing is next to it, the impact site. Well, we're, we're going back. 
a little bit of dead time. Okay, in the meantime, while they're working on that, continue my story here. All right. You could not see the impacts occurring, although the Galileo spacecraft, you'll all remember, is in a perfect view to get some good pictures of that. And so that will be fascinating to see. Here we go. See the great red spot? See the little white oval? And now further on, you see that black splotch. It was not there the day before. <laughs> it's a new feature on Jupiter. And we're going to have 20 more of them. Even brighter. It's going to be a great week. So I think I'll stop there and let the rest of my team have some time to talk. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the other members of the science team. Thank you, Dr. Hamill. Uh, to her left, Dr. Hal Weaver of the Space Telescope Science Institute, member of the Wide Field and Planetary Camera 2 and Faint Object Spectrograph teams. Uh, next, Dr. Keith Knoll of the Institute, a member of the Faint Object Spectrograph and High Resolution Spectrograph team. Uh, next is Dr. John Clark, University of Michigan, and a member of the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 and Faint Object Camera teams. Following that is Dr. Bob West of Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he's a member of the Wide Field Planetary Camera. And uh, and the, at the end, hi down there, Melissa, Dr. Melissa McGrath of Space Telescope Science Institute, a member of the Faint Object Spectrograph and High Resolution Spectrograph teams. And what I'd like to do at this point is turn it over to Hal and, and just for a few brief uh, comments and the discussion members of the team and we'll open it to Q&A. Okay. First of all, I'd just like to say it looks like this comment was not a dud. Let it ring out to the rest of the world. Uh, we've had a you know, wonderful time observing this fascinating object up until now, but of course uh, it's been highly uncertain as to how big these pieces are. are. The last, uh, we took just some images of the comet on Thursday, uh, and there were some reports that the comet was fragmenting, but in fact when you look at the Hubble images there was no evidence that, you know, the, com the uh, pieces were fragmenting. And uh, the fact that we see a plume uh, coming out of this uh, explosion there's very strong evidence that these nuclei are traveling very deep into Jupiter's atmosphere. It's hard to understand how you have something that's going to shoot out above the limb by a thousand kilometers or more uh, unless you had a plume formed an explosion deep down in the atmosphere. That would be my preliminary uh, guess of what's going on. All right, uh, just for a, a couple of moments, I know everyone is uh, prepared here for uh, a lot of questions and we would like to uh, go ahead and open it up in just a moment. But we do have right now to show you a video that was uh, taken just a few minutes, uh, actually a few hours ago during the initial receipt of the data here at the Hubble Institute. So go ahead and roll the video and uh, we'll see the reaction. So it's Okay, we're looking for something much you un go back. This is the first time. Yeah, this is the latitude that we're looking for something right there. The contours you could tell pretty well, but there wasn't too much there. Sure. We, we will rerun this. Uh, so this red spot. Oh, look! Oh, my God! Okay, look we will rerun this uh, in here. Oh, look. For the benefit of the uh, members in the uh, gallery here, uh, we will have a rerun of this tape later. We apologize, we had some tape sync problems. The uh, signal went out on the satellite okay, however I understand, so uh, we will replay it and we have some uh, dubs available for uh, the media that need that after, uh, after the briefing. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but. Be, uh, well, we're, we're all uh, working in real time here and we do have a few um, uh, uh, difficulties with some technical equipment as we're trying to work through. But I'd like to open it up to uh, questions and answers if we're all ready for that here in the uh, Institute in Baltimore. And please wait for the microphone and state your name and affiliation. Any questions? In front row. Wait for the microphone. 
uh, Linda Howe, Chancellor Communications, Philadelphia. Uh, in one of the email uh, releases out here, it said that the Nordic Optical Telescope in La Palma in the Canary Islands had reported that two hours after the first bright image was seen that there, a black dot became visible in the video image of Jupiter at exactly the same position of this bright impact. What could make this black dot be seen two hours after this impact we're looking at here? Pretty simple. Part of the part of the answer to that is pretty simple. Um, the impact occurred at a certain time, and we saw uh, apparently a plume on the on the limb of, of Jupiter at that time. And then, uh, as Jupiter rotated into our uh, rotated around as as it does, uh, the impact site came into our view, and that impact site is a place where we now see dark material. And so, as J Jupiter continues to rotate that's coming more and more into our field of view. And I think the fact that they're reporting seeing that two hours after the initial plume is that uh, initially it was, it was close to the, uh, the edge of where the sunlight is and very difficult to see on the edge of Jupiter. And I think their camera system uh, was probably not good enough, had, didn't have enough uh, resolution to see that until it rotated far enough into, into view that they could pick it up. Whereas uh, we saw it essentially immediately, or at least in the next orbit. And there's also the question, uh, maybe uh, part of your question is why are we seeing black material? And that's a more interesting question. I don't think yeah. anybody expected us to see black material. I certainly didn't. I expected that we would see perhaps bright material in the methane image, which we do see. But in other images, I thought we might not see anything. Uh, the re uh, and I'm going to speculate now about why we might be seeing black material. There's a couple of possibilities, and I think what we're seeing here are particles either from the comet itself or particles that may have been dredged up from deeper in Jupiter's atmosphere. If the particles are from the comet, they could be um, partly silicate particles and maybe a little bit of iron in there. Uh, they could also be uh, carbonaceous material, which normally is black. The trouble with that explanation, though, is that uh, we expect that material to ha have undergone very high temperatures, something like 40,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, at those temperatures, any particles would vaporize. The carbon would probably go into uh, carbon monoxide gas, and we wouldn't see it. That's one reason it's very puzzling. Um, as the fireball would rise out of the atmosphere, the plume rises, uh, everything cools very quickly, and out of that cooling cloud, you expect uh, things to condense like silicates uh, and maybe even some of these carbonaceous particles if they're still around. And finally, ices like water or ammonia ice we expect would condense uh, as, a, as the thing cools enough. Now, ices we expect to be white. So again, we're, we're puzzled. Why are we seeing dark stuff? Um, and going further in speculation, uh, we expect that uh, in Jupiter's atmosphere there's a lot of sulfur, although we haven't observed it spectroscopically yet. We think there is. We think that if there's material dredged up from the atmosphere, it might be rich in sulfur as well as other things, water and ammonia. Uh, sulfur can, can form colored compounds. Uh, and just w what kind of compounds would form in this situation, I'm not prepared to say. Uh, and so I'm guessing that maybe uh, sulfur, sulfur ions in some form are contributing to this dark stuff. Just quick follow-up. Uh, in addition to the mystery of the color, I also wondered if seeing this two hours after, the, after perhaps the initial impact, does that mean that we could be seeing the residue of these impacts for much longer than anyone ever thought? I'm not sure about longer than anyone ever thought because in my thinking, I uh, expect that we should be able to see the, re the residuals, these particles in the stratosphere, for possibly a year or longer. And in fact, when I proposed to do this uh, observing, it was to uh, look over long time scales to use these particles as tracers of the stratospheric motion. I see this, uh, I viewed this event as possibly analogous to on Earth when there's a large eruption from uh, like El Chichon or Pinatubo, volcanic eruptions put particles high in the atmosphere where, they're, where the stability of the atmosphere is, is, the atmosphere is very stable and therefore 
particles can reside there for a long time. And in fact, on the Earth, this is one way we learn about the dynamics and circulation of the stratosphere is by watching how these particles spread with time. And so I saw this as the, the first opportunity ever of doing this kind of thing on Jupiter. And the time scales for spreading on Earth in the stratosphere are of the order of a year or so. And I expect that we may still be seeing stuff a year from now from these events. Right here at second row. Uh, wait for the mic, please. And also, I'd like to ask the panel members to uh, introduce yourself also to, uh, to uh, help us out here. Thank you. Uh, Bob Cook, Newsday. I understand one of the really interesting possibilities was that comets might get deep enough to punch through the water clouds if they exist. Do you think that might have happened? Um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, sorry, Keith Knoll from Space Telescope Science Institute. Uh, one of the key things in all the spectroscopic observations that we'll be looking for, both with Hubble Space Telescope and ground-based telescopes, are molecules that are dredged up from the deep atmosphere. And as you said, uh, the water cloud would be one of the things that we'd be looking for very keenly. The reason for that is that if we see a huge increase in the amount of water, more than could have come from the comet itself, we'll know something about the energy of the impactor and how deep it penetrated into the atmosphere. So we'll be using these molecular clues, the debris from the comet and the stuff churned up from the atmosphere, to tell us things about the size of the comet, how deeply it penetrated into the atmosphere. And as Bob alluded to before, uh, possibly allow us to see molecules that until now have been too deep in J Jupiter's atmosphere for us to sense remotely. In the past few weeks, we've been told that amateur astronomers have little chance of seeing this event. Uh, does what you've seen so far make you a little more optimistic about uh, what the unwashed masses or the semi-washed masses, <laughs> washed masses might see? I'm Melissa McGrath from the Space Telescope Science Institute. The most dramatic um, results we've seen so far, brightness-wise, have actually been in the infrared. And so unless they had infrared instruments, um, I think actually in the visible it's, un it's unlikely that this would have been seen. Hubble saw it because um, it has such good resolution. And when you see the images tomorrow of the first plume that we detected, it was very small, very small, and very close to the limb. And because Jupiter's so bright, that's very difficult to see with anything but Hubble. So I imagine, I mean, we know that the B impact is at 1030. <laughs> and some of us would actually like to go outside with our binoculars at 1030 and look, because B is a lot bigger than A, and so, uh, or a lot brighter than A, so we think that means a lot bigger. So, you know, it, it wasn't so bright in A in the visible, but B may be brighter, and I think we should all go look. <laughs> Here, second row front. And please uh, state your name and affiliation. Linda Chu, San Jose Mercury News. I'm a little puzzled about how to describe this thing to readers. Um, what, was it dark? Was it bright or what? Because some of the email messages were describing something bright enough at certain wavelengths of light that it outshone anything else on Jupiter from the, the, the things that look like polar caps in, in the methane band to anything else, and even outshone Io. And then then you're talking about, I guess, in the visible wavelengths, the thing is dark. And so I don't know if I tell people that this is a real bright thing and it outshone everything, am I really misleading them? And what is the significance of this methane band or the infrared, the infrared bands that you're observing? What are you seeing that, that is different from what you're seeing in, in visible light? OK, I'll, I'll take that. I'm John Clark, University of Michigan. Um, let me start with the infrared bands. In the infrared, you're looking, you can think of it as heat. Um, as much as it is light. As you go farther into the infrared, you're sampling lower temperatures. And these were at temperatures that are much hotter than, than what we have here in, in this room. Um, they were at a wavelengths of about two microns, where it appeared very bright. And there, it appeared bright because that one localized region was much hotter than the tops of Jupiter's clouds overall. 
so it appeared to have a high <laughs> contrast. When we look at these visible wavelengths, we're looking at sunlight that's reflected from the cloud tops. And there, there's, much, there's relatively less contrast here than you see in the infrared. But there's more information about the um, disturbance because we have the better resolution. In the methane band filter in particular, we're looking at a particular wavelength of light, of sunlight, that is absorbed by gas, methane gas, in Jupiter's atmosphere. And there, Jupiter overall appears much darker because the, the sunlight is being absorbed by the gas that's normally in the atmosphere. And there, the, the comet fragment appears relatively bright, just as a matter of contrast. So it's a relative uh, brightness thing there. We also will be getting images in the ultraviolet wavelengths. Um, the first ones come in in, uh, well, about eight or 10 hours will be taken, and they'll come down tomorrow. And in the ultraviolet, um, which is my main interest, we'll be observing the very highest parts of Jupiter's atmosphere. And from what we've seen already in the, the lower parts, it, I'm looking forward to seeing the images. And uh, we'll get those tomorrow about noon. Up in the front. Bill Hart with CBS, and I, I might have missed this earlier. And if I did, I apologize. Can anyone give us a, a scale for the structure that we're seeing here? That I mean, box. Just, and, and the timing on it. When, how long after the impact this was, and how big this is? And I have a follow-up. The box that you see, the zoom box, is about two Earth diameters. So that that structure that you're seeing, that circular pattern, is about the size of the Earth. Jupiter's a big planet. Remember that this is the A impact. G is much brighter. I, I am keeping remembering that. My next question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a whole bunch of questions. But I don't suppose that looking at this raw data, uh, that we know any or have any better guesstimate as to how deep this this thing plunged. I mean, well, as I said, the fact that you see the plume means that, you know, you probably went very deep and produced a fireball like the theorists have been describing. And, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a plume that extends out more than 1,000 kilometers above the normal limb of the planet. So um, I think that's, that's pretty good evidence that, you know, these impacts really are 200,000 megatons of TNT or more. Um, well, I guess what I meant was, did it, did it, did, does this match what you would expect from the model, uh, how deep you, you thought you would get to get this kind of effect? There were so many models, you could have matched anything. I was unveiled by the shoemakers earlier tonight. I mean, is this matching pretty much what we they were doing? We missed the press yeah. conference. Well, we, we were watching the images come in. We, we can't tell you that when the shoemakers saw the images, Gene Shoemaker was extremely happy. So apparently it matched pretty well. And, and the last question for me is how surprised were you people are really? Did you, well, you couldn't right see that video, <laughs> but we were pretty yeah. darn surprised. <laughs> This, this is in my dreams, the kind of stuff we, we saw. We, we couldn't have gotten any better. No, this is incredible. Next question, second row. Um, Ron Cowan, Science News. Um, so is there an agreement now about when this, when A actually hit Jupiter or? Hit? We're working on that right now. <laughs> and would you, I mean, would you say Hubble uh, saw this a minute after, a few minutes after, 30 minutes after? You know, a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. An hour and a half. Hour and a half. <laughs> half. Well, that is, but we yeah. saw the image on the limb, and that was probably within 10 minutes? Yeah, within five, minutes. Uh, five, five minutes. minutes. Five to 10 minutes, yeah. yeah. We, we, and some of the ones later on in the week are actually impacting closer to the limb, some, and they are brighter than this. Yeah, I, I would say one thing, the G probably has an energy that's about 25 times as high as uh, A. I'm just checking in. That black spot there is the diameter of Earth? Is that what you're saying? What, what are well, the box. You can fit two Earth diameters in that box. What about the black spot, which is the... That would be half the Earth <sighs> diameter, okay. maybe. But so that's what everybody knows that, yeah. Third to a half. And lastly, what's, again, at the moment, what's the best estimate for the diameter of fragment A? Between one and two kilometers. Hi, I'm Noel McCormick with uh, Space Times. 
Is there, uh, they took the image off. The, uh, would acoustic energy be visible from these strikes? Well, Mark Marley would think so. <laughs> we have a lot of debate about that. And possibly the, the, the uh, dark area away from the, uh, you know, that surrounds this, uh, the darkest area, could that be that type of energy? We've been debating it. I, my preference is to say no. I think it's very difficult to make something dark on Jupiter uh, from a pressure wave of something like that. I think, I think the likelihood is that anything that's dark on Jupiter is caused by uh, particles in the atmosphere that are absorbing light. But as I say, this is far from being settled, and I think time will tell. We also have a better data set than this to look f for those kind of phenomena. And furthermore, those phenomena are most likely to be detected in infrared imaging because those waves are temperature changes. And so those are, that's the primary way to detect them. We're here seeing sort of a secondary effect from the temperature change. So it will be very interesting to see what the infrared telescopes around the world see from those brighter impacts. Next. Down here. Jim Reston for Esquire. Uh, does this first image give us any um, insight into the question of whether there will be a permanent cyclone on Jupiter? It's too soon to tell. Yeah, and when, uh, when will we start to get some fix on that question? Months? No, days? Days. Andy, sa Andy Ingersoll from Caltech says days. Okay, we're going to uh, go to a center right now for a question. Uh, I'm not sure which one we're lined up first. P perhaps they're not on the line right at the moment. Uh, we'll take another one here in this room. Down front. Will be, uh, uh, my name is Shin Yoshiko of NHK. I think this question will be doc, uh, Dr. McGrath. Um, do you see some change at the plasma torus or the aura at uh, Jupiter like in this stage? Actually, um, we don't do observations with the Hubble Space Telescope of the torus until the end of the week. Um, we will do some observations with the um, IUE satellite um, on Tuesday, I believe it is, of the IO torus. Um, one in interesting thing that was reported closely related to that is that um, some Japanese observers, radio observers, apparently saw a tenfold increase in the decimetric radio emission from Jupiter well before the impact. So there is some evidence that there was a large disturbance in the magnetosphere. So I think we have high hopes that there may also be disturbance to the Io Taurus. There haven't been any auroral images with HST since the impact, but there will be, and we should be able to answer that question soon. Those first auroral images will come down tomorrow. We're going to uh, go to Kennedy Space Center now for a question there, and we'll come back after that. Uh, go ahead, uh, state your name and affiliation, please. This is Joe Chan, Earth News. Uh, can you establish a minimum mass now for this uh, piece, uh, and assuming the, the rough density that you've been assuming, uh, just how much kinetic energy was involved in it? Can you establish any lower limit now that would have been required to produce the fact that you saw? I think the fact that we see the plume and apparently some very hot stuff, uh, which seems to, you know, back up some of the models or, or uh, some of the models predicted this kind of uh, phenomena if the impactor was about a kilometer in size. Uh, the fact that we see something, you know, close to that indicates to me that we're talking about something roughly a kilometer in size, which means roughly 200,000 megatons of equivalent uh, TNT, uh, but whether or not it's, uh, you know, one kilometer versus two kilometer versus uh, even 500 meters, uh, I think that, you know, I couldn't say that right now. I couldn't, you know, tell you which one versus the other at this point. Uh, follow up, please. So I remember the spectrograph the teams. Uh, were you able to do any quick uh, spectrograph of the area, or is that still in the future? And what would you expect at the 889 uh, nanometers at the, at the methane line? Uh, the first spectra, we've gotten baseline spectra over the last few days, but the first spectra we're going to get will be of the G impact site, 
uh, and that's going to be on Monday morning. All our spectra are going to be ultraviolet spectra. Visible wavelength spectra will be done uh, from ground-based telescopes, and uh, infrared spectra will be taken also from ground-based telescopes. So we are doing what Hubble can uniquely do, and that is obtain uh, high-resolution ultraviolet spectra. And what can you tell us, uh, anybody in the panel, about those, these other images? I really said you're just showing us the blue one, whereas you took several different snapshots in different wavelengths uh, as far as uh, um, just how different do they appear, and will you get us either a false color or an imitation full color picture by the morning? Well, I'd like to get a little sleep tonight. <laughs> um, at, at most of the wavelengths that we looked at, the, the feature appears to very similar to what we sh were showing in the blue. So at almost all the wavelengths, this dark streak with that circular pattern around it is what you see. The only exception is the methane band wavelength. And as I said before, that appears to be a complete negative. What you see dark is bright. So you see a little bright streak with a little bright swirl around the bottom of it. It's too soon to talk about colors of this thing yet because we, we just simply have not had the time to work on it. We will probably be trying to put together some color reconstructions. Um, I can't guarantee that will be tomorrow morning. We'll do the best we can. I'd like to come back to the, the uh, Telescope Institute here for some more questions uh, in front. Tagami on BBC Television. Uh, it's quite clear that the science team is very excited about this, and you guys are going to have a lot of data to go through for months to come. But what's in it for the guy on the street? What does it mean to him? He can be glad he doesn't live on Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean in terms of the knowledge? Of the, uh, well, uh, we've, we've never had the opportunity to know in advance that a comet or a broken up asteroid or whatever it is was going to hit a planet. This is the first time in the history of, of humans we've been able to look at this and study it. And uh, we're lucky now that it's a big one so we can really see the effects. And um, we'll be learning more about how that process operates and how long, how deep these effects are in the atmosphere of Jupiter and how long they last. This has relevance to the Earth, we think, more in terms of the origins of the Earth. Uh, we believe that the Earth was formed by um, accretion of material coming in from space. And this gives us an idea. There's been talk about whether this might have been caused the demise of the dinosaurs. Uh, we won't probably be able to prove that, but we'll learn more about the general process and the history of the Earth and maybe the future. So. Can I just add to that? I think there's a little bit more to it than just the science. And of course, we're interested in the science here because that's what we do. But it's a fascinating thing. I mean, there are things whizzing around the solar system, smashing into other things with huge explosions. And that's just really incredible to think about. I mean, you know, we don't often think about the universe out there. We just sort of look at the sky and the stars are there, big deal. But if we really sit, take a step back, and it's a really dynamic world out there. It's a dynamic universe. And this is just a key example of some of the energetics that go on. Next question, second row. Uh, from the estimate of the, uh, of the size of the plume, do we uh, have any fix on whether, whether enough material will be deposited around to, to create a, a new ring around Jupiter? Well, I, th I think that, you know, all of that material is just going to fall right back down. The stuff that might contribute to the ring is the stuff that misses Jupiter. Basically, you know, the dust that you saw around the comet you know, everything that, you know, you saw in that plume is coming right back down. You know, it's gravitationally bound to Jupiter and it's, you know, not going to escape. So um, we do have, you know, we had a fair amount of dust and maybe there will be people, there will be people looking for, for the formation of a ring. Is there anything about any of your oh, Please wait for the mic. And uh, is there anything about any of your experimentation that might indicate when this is all over whether there's any kind of a more solid core in the center of this otherwise gaseous planet? Mm -hmm. I'll answer that, I guess. Um, we already know a lot about Jupiter, and from uh, Voyager flybys and Pioneer spacecraft flybys, we have a pretty good idea of its interior structure. And uh, we know that there is a uh, 
<coughs> probably a solid core, but that is uh, very much, much deeper down than these comments could possibly penetrate. The only thing that, well, there is another piece to this. The seismic wave phenomena may end up telling us something about something different, and that is the boundary between gaseous hydrogen and a phase of hydrogen that comes about only under very high pressures and in Jupiter. Uh, we believe that this occurs, although it's not exactly clear where that transition occurs. So there's some hope that we'll learn about that. Uh, just quick follow-up, is it possible that any of these pieces could penetrate deeply enough into wherever this hard matter is that part of the dark stuff actually could be substance from the hard interior of Jupiter? No. no. Any further questions? Oh, front row. Uh, what do you expect from the larger, ex from the larger impacts uh, down the line? with uh, what you know now. <laughs> More uh, spots. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is just a preview. It looks like it's going to be an even bigger show for the rest of the week. The only thing special about this one was that it was first. the first one. And we've got some 20 odd more to go, including some much brighter ones. So you wouldn't expect the bigger ones to penetrate farther, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next over here, uh, please, name and affiliation, please. Chris Leach from NHK. Is there anything you can tell about what kinds of chemical reactions were taking place during the impact? Not, not, can I, should I start? Yeah. Not, not from this. This is just strictly imaging, but now I'll pass it over to Keith. Yeah, that's what we hope to learn about later in the week when we get the spectroscopic data back. That will tell us about the composition of the atmosphere. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I think we will go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, we will, what we'll like to do to before we uh, close <laughs> and uh, lose the satellite is have uh, another replay of the still image and we'll run both the videos. And for the benefit of those here, we'll, uh, we'll have that on the monitor. Uh, also, I want to remind everyone that tomorrow morning, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time, we will have uh, a briefing which will have uh, more images, uh, also some information from other observatories in the NASA and NSF observing campaign. And uh, at that panel, we'll have uh, doctors uh, Shoemaker and uh, Carolyn Shoemaker and Dave Levy and member of the Hubble science team. And uh, we hope to see you out there. And that will be also live on NASA Select with Q&A from the centers. Uh, at that point, we'll go ahead and close the uh, press conference. Thank you for coming. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. These spots are bright. Thank you.
So it's on the way on the other side. Okay, we're looking for something. Why don't you go back? This is the first target. Yeah, this is the latitude that we're looking for something right there. The contours you could tell pretty well that there wasn't too much there. This is the four second thing. So there's a red spot. Oh, look how good. Yeah, that's it. Oh my god. Look at that. Spread out. Unbelievable. Oh, 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 oh